Okay, so I'm Diane Barrett, and this is Laura Jeffrey. We're with the BE Collection. We're here with <clears throat> Greta Kammermeyer and Diane Devilbess. Mm -hmm. And it is August 1st, 2022. And we're at, um, we're doing the To Have and To Hold, a um, couple's relationship. So the first question I always have is, um, how long have you been together? 34 years. Yeah, still. <laughs> still. <laughs> 34. 34 years, that's great. We've been together 46. 46? 46. Yeah. And, uh, wow. I know. That's <laughs> really amazing, actually. That's why we're sitting in front of this green street with the LA County behind us. This is where we met LA oh, County Hospital. In the hospital, were you both nurses or something? She said, I'm a nurse, and um, Marge is an orthopedic surgeon. Wow. <clears throat> and uh, wow, both. Yeah. yeah, I always say that I, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew where I wanted to go, uh -huh. and uh, I wound up being the twenty fifth woman in the United States to be an orthopedic surgeon. So there, <laughs> that's yeah. right. I used to know where I wanted to go, so I kept going there. You know, yeah. Didn't realize what streets I was going over to get there. Uh huh. Well, it's better not to know. Yeah. In advance. <laughs> there are a lot of things I don't want to know about. <laughs> but I went. To, um, I'm from Chicago, and I um, came from a large hospital in Chicago as a new graduate, basically. And I wanted to work at someplace big, so I picked this place. And I was became the head nurse in orthopedic surgery. Uh -huh. and that's where we met. Oh. But it was a slow introduction, but we <laughs> we got there. <laughs> we got there. <laughs> How about you? Where did you meet? Lincoln City, Oregon, on really? July 4th. Uh -huh. Wonderful. What a great day to meet. Exactly. What was the occasion? Were you at a picnic? Uh, I was down in uh, Lincoln City with my sons um, over the 4th of July weekend. Uh, I had divorced my husband about eight years previously, but uh, would uh, have the kids with my aunt. And uh, we were there for the 4th of July weekend and meeting up with some other friends. I was. Um, and uh, those other friends decided that um, Diane needed to meet me. And so they made arrangements with her to come to Lincoln City at that same time. They had actually made arrangements for the year before. And then something fell through, I forget. Some of the people uh, got uh, uh, sidetracked. And um, anyway, plans didn't mesh. And so the following year, uh, they- The arrangements- the year before for you to meet Greta? Well, to, to really? yes. Yeah. And then uh, I got this sort of threatening notice the following year, which said, uh, okay, no more excuses. Um, you absolutely have to be here. And it was a hard summer for me because I was uh, the uh, chair of the uh, art department at Cal Poly uh, University in Pomona. And um, uh, which is on the quarter system. And so I was, uh, th this was right in the middle of the quarter system, July 4th. So what does this mean? It means that you stop your life. <laughs> life um, and then you come back after the weekend and you resume. So it's no real vacation because you're trying to set it up so that you can leave and you're exhausted. And then you come back and you're, st you're, you're still tired from such a long trip. Um, and then you have to start work immediately. So, uh, but anyway, I knew I couldn't beg off. And <laughs> so anyway, that's how I, I, I went um, uh, from um, uh, Southern California then to the Portland airport. And then I had to wait all day and then take a bus ride out to the beach where I was met 
by uh, uh, the person who had set us up. Um, and um, I was driving. And Greta was the driver. And it's <laughs> sort of charming because this person who had set, set me up <laughs> is the one who had said that you were really uh, like uh, Greta. She's a, she's a big Norwegian um, nurse and she has big sons. And I- <laughs> Just what you always wanted, right? <laughs> and this didn't um, do anything for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I wasn't really interested in meeting this big Norwegian nurse. <laughs> You know, and how does that sound? It sounds like somebody who's got a lot of bedpans and who, who's mopping the floors and she's got big sons who are probably just lying around. I don't know. And, um, <laughs> and you weren't uh, about to do that. No. And so <laughs> I got in the car and I looked at her and she was gorgeous. Okay. No, <laughs> She, I was shocked, you know, she was uh, beautiful. And her, when I met her sons, they were great kids. Who introduced you? Who made uh, the introduction when you finally got there? Oh, um, when we finally got there, I, I was just dropped off at um, uh, the big motel where they had made reservations. Um, and then, uh, it was really then the next day um, uh, we started so, doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so I it, it was raining. I was driving and dropped them off, uh, both Diane and the person that had ar arranged all of this. So I dropped them off at the at the motel, and then we made sort of arrangements. I think it was the, to get together the following day. And uh, because Diane was going to go to the flea markets. And so uh, I was going to drive her to the flea markets. And my boys like to do that also. So we all got in the car. And so she ended up meeting the boys in the car as she was going to the flea markets. Now, the way we go is we just sort of go through and do a reconnaissance, see if there's anything we're interested in. And then Which we know there never on. is for them. <laughs> and, and and Diane, you know, so we we told asked if there was anything special she was looking for, and no, she was just looking around. Little did I realize that for the past thirty four years now, when she goes to a flea market or something, it's every item has to be scrutinized. You so, don't want to mix anything. <laughs> I mean, and she may buy nothing, but she knows everything that's in there. So nowadays, when we do that, I always take a book and sit outside, either in the car or in the sun, and and just sort of leave it at that, uh, because nothing moves Diane at a faster pace than she is ready to move. It's very similar, actually, to how I grew up. My mother and I would love to shop, and my father loathed it, but he was happy to do anything for my mother and his daughters and so on. So he would drive us any place and he would sit out in the car or on a bench and work crossword puzzles. Uh -huh. so, and, okay. so it's the same thing. You yeah. see, I, I didn't realize I was causing such a disturbance. Well, it wasn't a disturbance. It was just a different <laughs> just a reality. A different reality is for sure. You know, I... I was always very regimented, I think. And then, you know, the 30 years in the military didn't change that much. Uh, so we have totally different ways of being in the world. But you know, I, I think what we have in common is our values. Mm -hmm. and, and that sort of overrides everything else and our mutual respect and um, the things that we cherish. Um, and, uh, Including one another. Yeah. I there was one that. thing about, about that 4th of July weekend that was um, uh, really wonderful. And that is uh, the night of the 4th, uh, Lincoln City is a, is a beach town. And it's We've wonderful. been there. You, Marsh, uh, Marsh grew up in Oregon. 
Oh, oh sure. In medical school in Portland. So. Oh, okay. We go to Oregon every year. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, so on the night of the 4th, um, Greta and her boys had, had made sort of a tent shelter and a, and a wonderful big uh, fire. And, uh, and they had made uh, uh, s'mores. Uh, well, you, we all made s'mores from uh, what uh, they had supplied. But in addition to the usual um, uh, crackers and chocolate and mush- marshmallows and everything, they uh, distributed slices of very green, um, tangy green apples hmm. to, to go with it. It's a delicious combination, which I had never experienced before. And um, uh, did, you have the, did you have a room separate from all from Greta? Did your friend uh, reserve? No. Uh, Greta was staying with her aunt. Oh, I see. Yeah. And, um, and her <laughs> sons. Yeah. But then her boys, uh, uh, like to uh, crab at night. And so this was going to be their last night at Lincoln City. And uh, they wanted to stay up and uh, do the crabbing by throwing the crab pots over the pier, the side of the pier. And so um, Greta said, well, would anybody uh, um, want to spend the night? You want to stay, stay up all night? Stay up all yeah. night because I'm not going to spend the night with me. <laughs> but keep her You're a little devious, but quite direct. <laughs> keep her company. And uh, okay. anyway, we had all gone back to the motel, and then everybody else um, was coupled up except me. And so everybody, I was exhausted. I mean, I was just flat out dead tired. And everybody said, Diane, you go, you go, you go, you can go, you're by yourself. You can go keep her company. Da, da, dee, 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 dee. I went, oh, I just can't do it. Go. So, so somebody said, well, we'll drive you back or you were there to pick me up. I forget. And um, well, I dropped everybody off and then it was who was going to come back with me to stay right. up all night. Right. You had a plan. <laughs> right. So plan. anyway, I was back <laughs> at the beach. And this is the funny thing. I had always been told that Greta, yes, she was a big Norwegian nurse, but she was also silent and she never talked. That was even worse. I mean, I thought so right away, I thought she was dumb. Um, you see, so um, nurses are not dumb. <laughs> oh, I know now. Um, right. <laughs> and so uh, uh, she talked all night. <laughs> so what happened? Talked all night long. And that's what kept us. I mean, I was awake and her boys were out crabbing. And then, uh, and then as the sun started to come up, Greta said, I wish this night would Never end. A romantic. I love that. Isn't that lovely. <laughs> yeah. And then we decided yeah. we, would, we would fix breakfast for for everybody. So we drove what to the Safeway and bought all the stuff. Her kids were so flaked out, except for Tom, the youngest, who who practically fainted during breakfast. He was so exhausted. <laughs> but David was yeah had had collapsed. And uh, Andy had collapsed in the bathtub. Yep. And um, uh, so, and, what did you say when she said, "I wish this night would never end"? What was your response to that? I was just flabbergasted. I loved it. I think uh, I, I agreed. You know. Yeah. It's just wonderful. It's it's actually depicted very nicely in the movie, uh, "Serving in Silence." Mm-hmm. Uh, you You've know, seen that? Yeah, with uh, with Glenn Close. Uh, that uh, that that scene uh, around the fire and uh, the guitar playing and stuff like that that um, that really happened. Uh, yeah. Most of what I mean, there were only two slight modifications in the film, anyhow. And so that that really sort of sets the tone for what our relationship has been ever since. I think. Uh, uh, in terms of family and and um, treasuring one another, and, uh, and then the next day, instead of driving off into the sunset, um, <laughs> right after the breakfast, um, Greta puts her kids in the uh, Dodge uh, van, 
and off they go and they're pulling a boat and then off they go back to um, uh, the Seattle area. And then I uh, get on a bus and go back to the Portland, go yeah. back to Portland. And actually I spent a, a, the, that afternoon uh, at the Portland uh, Art Museum, which I quite enjoyed, and then caught a night flight, an evening flight back home and went to work the next day. But I was uplifted the next day. I wasn't yeah. head yeah. flat like <laughs> I thought I was going to be. Yeah. <laughs> right. Very exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then um, I immediately bought a, um, a round trip air flight ticket uh, over the Labor Day um, oh, right, right. weekend. And uh, I didn't even see- before I'd invited her. Oh, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> I was going to go whether she had to wait for permission. I could tell that about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had purchased the ticket. And then just about a week or so before the Labor Day thing, I got this sweet little note um, which said, uh, Would you like to come up for the Labor Day weekend? I would love to have you up here and so forth. And I thought to myself, I was just so amused, really. I thought to myself, little did she know that I I've, had that ticket. <laughs> I've had that ticket since day one, you know. <laughs> did you tell her? Course. And so I went, of course. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can work it into my schedule. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> and I was being very casual and yeah. um, just sort of low-key about it. Uh-huh. I didn't know how this was going to proceed. But life took over, and um, we've managed to make it work ever since. Happily so. Right. It does happen. You meet the right person, and you make it work. Yeah. Because you wanted to. And and you ended up working with Marge? Mm-hmm. Uh, down the road a ways. She, in the operating room, when she was a resident, I was um, aware of her. She was the chief <laughs> person on the OM, right? So, her, you know, everything had to go through her. So that's an important element to our relationship. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would agree there. I wonder I know you would. The nurse, right? uh, the nurse said, what, you made plans without consulting? <laughs> right, what do you mean? You didn't talk to me about this? <laughs> yeah. No, um, we didn't get together right then. Everyone, it was a time when the lesbians were around. And certainly in medicine, there are a lot of them, as you know. But um, they were quiet about it. Okay. And so everybody felt that Marge was probably gay, but she didn't really say. Um, that was still and I was still coming out myself with other. I have uh, Sue Wegeman, one of the women we interviewed here on the you can, collection was a student when I was there and we've been friends ever since she's in Seattle so we stayed out till two in the morning going to different bars and stuff I mean we were active but scared well I was yeah. still under the if you're gay you lose your license that's time. right and uh, so it wasn't until a few years later that that went away okay. that went away that was a Breathe them. You know, you got to go to parties and know people and do things and not be afraid of losing your license because you were found at a party. Right, right. So that's not what, 77? Yeah, 76. And in 1977, I opened a practice in Santa Maria. Before that, I was with Kaiser. And we both, when we got connected, had other relationships going on. So I met um, a woman at the airport when I was looking for my baggage who said I should get involved with Marge. <laughs> I, said, I thought, who is this person? I was waiting for my bag to come around. And I thought, well, it's a pretty good idea. I knew you know, who she was. <laughs> and she ended up, she was the head of, some, of the physical therapy department. She spotted me. You know, everybody spots lesbians, right? And, yeah. uh, I thought, well, 
okay, you know, I like that idea. So eventually we got involved. In this place, the county hospital, right on the side, Marja picked me up there every Tuesday and we'd go off together and I'm the Tuesday night lady. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and did she have ones for Wednesday and Thursday also? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I was then I started I'm going to I've gone to school a lot, so I was busy, 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 changing careers. But um we've known each other a long time and respected each other. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It, I can see that in your relationship too. Yeah. Anyway, um so what do you think keeps your relationship magical? We have nothing to do with one another's <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of our professional lives. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are totally separate, totally different. Um, I am an absolute novice when it comes to art, and I wouldn't trust Diane to take care of my little toe. <laughs> Oh, she probably you all right. <laughs> she could paint it. Look at no. it this way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we had an adult family home for about 15 years. And uh, this yeah. I, actually, I, I, I should change that a little bit. Her mother came to live with us. Yeah. And uh, as she was getting uh, more and more <laughs> demented, um, it, it was she was needing more and more care. And I was gone one day and I came home and uh, Diane was sort of frustrated. Her mother hadn't really allowed her to get her ready for bed. So I come in to check on her mother and she's laying in bed absolutely naked. And uh, that evidently, uh, well, do you want to tell what? what? When I was growing up, if I ever (laughs) back my mother, that was it. That was it for the day. All right, young lady, you can go to your room and you go straight to bed. You will not have any toys. You cannot read in bed. The end. You will not talk back to an adult. You know, that was just. That's an expression we don't hear, is it? I heard that too. Talking yeah, about also, you don't be impudent, you know, impudent. Right. That was a big, huge word. Okay. <laughs> so I'm getting mother ready for bed. And of course, she has declined by that point. She, 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 she's about six years old mentally now. Oh. But um, I still was so slow in picking up on, on the fact that my mother, who had always been, she had always taught me everything and, and, you know, all this business was really as demented as she was. Anyway, I'm getting her ready for bed and I was pulling her shirt up over her head and she started to scream and she said, you're tearing me up, which I was, if you're six years old. And I said to her, well, then you can just lie there and rot. Isn't that terrible? She was a six year old then. No, I was my mother addressing a six. You can just lie there and rot, you know. So she was cold, but not dead <laughs> when, I got, when I got home. She got a pulse. <laughs> so got her ready for bed. I mean, that's an indication of uh, Diane's um, motherly nursing touch is probably not what you would want in a bind. But then you and your father. Hey. Winners. Well, yeah. Well, my father and I, we had a, uh, a, a power relationship. Uh huh. But uh, as you used to say, really, that your parents, you and your parents, have um, your parents can still press your buttons, mm-hmm. uh, even though you're you've grown up and stuff. It's amazing how an, a parent can still get to you. Mm-hmm. And, my father's uh, Nary's would 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 sort of wiggle <laughs> when I knew that he was going to say something that was going to push my buttons. I, I mean, I could just tell. And, uh, and and your kids later said that they could tell the same thing about yeah. you. Yeah. You, you. You developed that same habit. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, right. Not, no. No. no, we, our parents are not easy. We're probably not easy the way they looked at it either. But we are who we are. We are who we are. Yeah. 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 But but her, her folks were really charming and delightful. And even without ever using words like lesbian or partner or anything like that, they always were very warm and uh, accepting of me. Uh, I mean, so much so that once when I was down visiting uh, with Diane's parents, uh, they they liked go, to go to the casino. In and, Las Vegas. Uh, yeah. And her father w- gave me $50, just like he gave all of his other kids. Really? So uh, you knew you were uh, in then. Uh, right. I, I mean, it was just... It was just so warm and welcoming, uh, just delightful. Yeah. My father really liked Marge. And uh, my mother was fabulous. My dad was someone you wanted him to like you, and he liked her. I could see that. Right. Then we we have a daughter we adopted, and he became dad. She would Uh call him dad because we called him dad. My Uh mother did not like that. (laughs) (laughs) He was old. He was not her dad. Yeah. My mother had a hard time with it. But. I remember when I was growing up, my father had uh, sort of a habit of whenever we asked for uh, permission to do something, it was always no. You know, it was no to <laughs> everything and anything. And I decided that uh, when our children were growing up, that my answer was uh, always in my mind was going to be why not. Yeah. If I didn't have a good answer for why not, then they, 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 they shouldn't be denied whatever it was that they were wanting to do. And that's why, you know, uh, it fit that when we were down in Lincoln City, the kids were up all night crabbing. It's yeah. like, why not? It's right. Right. <laughs> they I'm want down, to stay up all night, fine. You know, and uh, everybody benefits. They get to do what they want. We get crab. Uh, and uh, I'm just sitting in the car waiting for them to get done, and that's that's what vacations are about, uh, yeah. really. And 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 I think that it makes for a much healthier relationship than one of always saying no, and the kids end up saying, uh, "Well, why not?" And mm-hmm. the answer being, "Because I said so." Right. I'm sorry. Because that doesn't apply. Right. And. And I, I I remember that as as a military officer, it it was that same that same sense that I had that regardless of what someone's rank was, they deserved to have uh, an appropriate answer to why it was that something had to go in a, in a certain direction. Uh, so at least for me, that that is a sort of an essence of. Uh, I was going to say your motto, you know, yeah, inside you is the go." and how much energy you put into doing something. So what keeps your relationship magical? I don't know. Every day we love every day. She well, works and I don't. Diane, is, just Diane is waited upon in the style that she has become accustomed. Huh. Good. Yeah. Okay. You deserve and, and it. Fortunately, I'm a, a, I think, sound mind and body. Uh-huh. And as, as she married, gets older, it was a cradle marriage. I was very, I was brilliant. <laughs> no, I mean it, it's only seven years difference, but you know, and she carries her age well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you know, I, the, a, a funny thing, I guess you could say, a funny thing happened on the way to Reno. Uh, <laughs> she was going down to visit her sister for one reason or another and um so uh, she was going to drive and uh it's about a 15 hour drive uh if you drive straight through from where we live and uh she's been doing this for you know for 20 years and so why shouldn't she do it now and i was mentioning this to a friend of ours and she looked at me the friend looked at me and said Diane is driving down alone. And I sort of was taken aback and it's sort of like, well, she's been doing it for 20 years. Why can't she do it now? Well, you know, she is 87 
And perhaps I should think a little bit more about that as a way of traveling and maybe should agree to accompany her. And so I've had to, you know, rethink a lot of things because there's no way of knowing that maybe she would like to have a little help because she's not going to say anything. But when I offered to drive uh, with her, it was, she was very accepting of, of that and had this what a shit eating shit, eat, shit eating grin uh and, and and said uh yeah you know yes i i would love that but i i mean we have to be careful not to take things for granted just because we've been doing something you know for as long as we have but for me it it it's a mindset a, a, a change of mindset because we have always had such independent lives. I mean, we meet for, we bump into one another in the house and we always have dinner together and then we share our day. And uh, yet we do very different things. Uh, Diane will be reading or doing her art and I will be out doing yard work or something medical that has to do uh, with with the hospital here on the island. And so, and I, th I think that keeps us both uh, separate but equal. Mm -hmm. uh, I and, we can appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're we not work together a lot, uh, but we've been separate a lot too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing is, is that we're both active in the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always loved that Greta is active in uh, um, the uh, Democratic Party, uh, Democratic Club, and we have a Democratic Summer Fest and so on. And uh, uh, she's a, uh, like she says, she's a hospital commissioner. And um, so she's at the hospital or in meetings several times a week and on um, different committees. And uh, and I've always been interested in like, I was on the Langley, uh, it was a city uh, arts commission and then the Langley Arts Fund and the Woodby Island Arts Council and, the fair. and all that. And the fair, yeah, yeah, the Island County Fair, which is just finished. And um, because I was as really active in that for about 20 years. That's and a long time. Now have hung up my spurs for uh, uh, <laughs> no longer the superintendent of the fine arts exhibit but I was its judge this year and that took up three days um, because you have to, you know, a fair is not like it's a regular not an You have to judge every single item just as though it were a can of peaches. That's your swap meet experience. Yeah. <laughs> just getting, right. preparing you for this. And that's right. And it takes that's the right. same amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> right. And you're out sitting in the sun, right? right. So you creep around, you creep around. And but she's really great. And what she doesn't say is that she um uh it helps, she's so willing to help. See, it always used to be fun. It still is fun. If I can come <laughs> in and add another picture or something to the house and hang it up when she's not there and see how long it takes her to spot it. And um <laughs> Sometimes it takes years. Sometimes <laughs> I know. It's a bit small. <laughs> uh, and then, um, but then sometimes I have to admit defeat. And um, uh, that's not your style. And it's not my style, but I'm so grateful now that <laughs> he's willing to um, uh, we'll work together to find a spot for something and she'll help hang it and so on. And it's really fun. I was well, there's no room. Oh no! Yes, you see, because the museum is full, but um, but of course we can add this, and so we start. Oh, plus the, that this, closet. This, this, is, this is the effect of downsizing, because the minute oh, we downsize and she gets one book out, she orders another dozen to come in, and <laughs> you know, so she just got done moving uh i think it was 18 pieces of of ceramics to uh, the, 28 28 to different museums down in in california and then she's now bought 
four more African masks. And or, or no, they weren't bought, they were given. Well, I yeah. accepted them. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> so 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 nothing nothing gets emptied long enough to be able to get stuff off the floor because we still have she still has a library of books on the floor beside her reading chair because there's no room in the bookcases. But I have an idea. You see, it's important to always have an idea. We archive some of it. You know, like I think I'm going to invite a certain person who's interested in this topic if she would like to come over and have um, most of these books right now and all the rest of them um, uh, when I croak uh, on this topic, you know, yes or no. And uh, so if I knew in, in advance that, and, and if for a big chunk to go out right now, then that would open up a spot to get the stuff off the floor. And, and we just got two boxes from uh, the uh, bookseller. Books, uh, bookseller. But the other problem with this, a lot, lot, of, lot of that is for Christmas gifts. She, for me, <laughs> autograph. <laughs> but and I mean, she she's an artist, and so uh, and she paints for herself. And we do have a gallery, and she's got a website, um, you know, Dival Bess Arts. But we have over two hundred and forty paintings downstairs in the gallery. Oh. And yes, and um, she keeps on painting. That's and, good. Yeah, well, but, but but what she doesn't pay attention to is what are we going to do with this? I would love to have that resolved. <laughs> well, you know what? I mean, you. You're what about archiving it? What about archiving it? Like where? You know, museums are very well, very tight. And, it's interesting because we've had to learn about archives during this project. Uh -huh. And I knew nothing about it when we started. So um, I thought about that painting after I retired because I said, where am I going to put it? And I'm done with it. <laughs> and we downsized. We moved from Santa Maria to Los Angeles to a small we cabin. Over a thousand square feet or more. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. I couldn't see where if you painted something, where you would put it. Yeah. So well, I just a lot of it's uh, racked. It's up on racks. What's that? A lot of my, my my stuff is in a storage downstairs. Have you ever talked to an archivist though? No. Mm -mm. Be interesting, huh? Yeah, but it, it's very difficult. I mean, here on the art uh, on the island, there are lots of artists, and yeah. every one of them is in the same situation. It's like mm -hmm. needing to find a space where all of this art can be stored and uh, you know put up and enjoyed and people go to it and it's all you know it's it's a very complicated thing yeah. and uh, you know our kids have some have gotten some of the art but um not enough mm -hmm. um so but that that's what comes i guess with getting older yeah so what when what do you, where do you see your future? You still have dreams and dead. Short. And? Oh, well, I'm going to go there. Right. Right. What are you going to do between now and then? See, that's what we're doing. I'm going to try. Trying to figure it out. Yeah, I'm going to try to uh, get back to printmaking. You know, COVID um, and everything shutting down. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't the only artist that that uh, we've talked about, uh, my artist friends and I, how many of us just seem to sort of, you know, pull in. I don't know how to pull it together. This is the best I've thought of this project. This is our life. This is what we do, you know. Right. But it's frustrating to know that you have all these gifts in your studio. And uh -huh. who's going to see them? I know. Yeah. Uh -huh. I do floral design. And I, what I like about that is I do it, give it away. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good thing. I see. The area I do it in is a mess. But sure. sure. I, it's, I, it's, it's like therapy. It's her area. It's my <laughs> area. It's right. Nobody yeah. else would want to go in. Well, but she has <laughs> all the stuff it takes to do. Right. Uh -huh. 
And then the doing of it, the nice part about that, as far as I'm concerned, is we don't have to we put a lot in the house, but we don't have to do so. We can give it away. Yeah. And, and it's a um, self, it's not like a painting. A painting goes on forever. The floral design is over in two weeks. So I had a question. Greta, when you were um, going through that trial and everything regarding your discharge or potential discharge, how did you... How did your relationship handle that? Well, it it was, um, we weren't living together at this time. Uh, and so Diane would come back and forth. Uh, and that, that was, you know, tremendously supportive for me. Uh, you know, I'll tell you how this started. Uh, Greta came home from... Um, we were actually, first of all, this was when I was up, uh, we were in Renton uh, before we had moved to uh, Des Moines. And uh, she had come home and she had said uh, that she had uh, applied for the uh, the war college. And I always, always, I've always been uh, horrified that there's such a thing as a war college but that's how you're trained to be a general, et cetera. Uh, and what she, know that, doing, did you? what she was doing was she wanted to, she was a Colonel and mm -hmm. she was interested in applying for the war college because then she wanted to uh, go up uh, towards a, a generalship. And anyway, she was being interviewed by uh, uh, some inspector or other, um, who, uh, and during the course of the interview, she said that she was a lesbian. And um, she, you continue with that. And then I start, because I was saying, um, uh, when I got interested or affected by this was when we were in Renton and you came home after that day of being grilled by that guy. So you tell that. Well, I, uh, yeah. Um because I was ambitious and wanted to become a general and had uh, was applying for the top secret clearance so I could go to the war college. Uh, one of the questions that was asked by the investigator had to do with, uh, I don't know, homosexuality or something like that. And ultimately I said, um, you know, I am a lesbian. And I think it was the first time that I had acknowledged that you know, this was who I was. And not that I was in a relationship, but that I had come to know who I was. And that was like a five hour interrogation. And that followed. Uh, <laughs> that followed that statement. And, you know, so it was really extremely stressful. And I came home uh, after it was over and looked a little green. Um, and uh, I told Diane and she said, well, your career is over. And I thought, well, you know, how is that possible? Here I am. I'm a colonel. I'm just finishing my PhD. I'm uh, uh, sort of a war veteran and and everything, and chief nurse of the National Guard. And um, so six months after that was when I was told that they were going to start discharge uh, proceedings against me unless I wanted to resign. I had. Um, Did they state that was the reason? Yeah, because, because of what I had, because of what I had said in the uh, interview, and uh, when I had first joined the military, you couldn't be married. Uh, then, as a woman, you couldn't have any dependents, and uh, you know, people fought to get those policies changed. And it seemed to me that maybe this was my opportunity to try to change this policy that existed in the military. And uh, so I chose not to res uh, resign or retire because I could have retired at that time uh, and instead um, fought, uh, fought to stay in and uh, ended up then being told that um, they were going to start discharge proceedings against me. Uh, I found uh, through peculiar ways, uh, a legal team through Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund and the Northwest Women's Law Center. And um, 
than the military itself. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it, it took it, it took two years before they discharged me. Uh, whereas if you heard about other cases, it happened like overnight. Uh, so my commanders did not want me to be discharged. The governor did not want me to be discharged. Uh, legislators here did not want uh, me to be gone. Uh, but, you know, the, the army decided that I needed to be gone. And um, because of uh, taking a long time to finally get it to happen, we were able to get good testimony and you know, establish the legal precedents to, so that when we took it into federal court, that everything would be in place so that we could fight my discharge. And uh, ultimately I, I was thrown out of the military and um, they, it, something called, you know, uh, taking away my, my um, sort of registration as a, as a military officer. And then we went immediately into federal court. Did they take away your standing of Colonel? Yes. Uh, well, they, they, they took away my standing in the military, but I was still, I, I was given an honorable discharge. Um, but, you know, on my discharge papers, it says uh, homosexuality as the reason uh, for it. And, um, then we spent the next uh, two years uh, going through the, the federal process of, of getting into federal court and getting depositions and, and uh, building the case. And in the meantime, uh, you know, I felt like I had sort of lost my identity. Wow. And I think, you know, the saving grace through all of that was if Diane was not up visiting that we talked every night. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to sort of debrief and she cared. Yeah. It, it, it was like, it, it mattered to her because it mattered to me. I mean, I, I don't think I, it's not that she was a, a military person, but that she knew how important this career had been for me. And and, and I, from time to time, I would think, you know, would I have been able to withstand all of this uh, doing it on my own? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to have somebody there uh, that, that cared was really significant in allowing me to, to keep moving forward with the case. And let me uh, butt in here. When she came home that first day, after having that grueling um, investigation. That's a uh, goose. Yeah, for hours. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently that guy had said to you, are you sure you, um, are you gonna write this down or why don't you write something else? Yeah, I needed to sign some papers and, and I said, well, I'll, I'll do that within the next day or so. And he said, well, no, uh, why don't I write it for you? Hmm because I know what needs to go on there. And so he, and you can read it and then, uh, and so uh, before you sign it. And so he went away and uh, wrote, a, you know, we had been, <laughs> it had been like a five hour uh, interrogation and he wrote a one paragraph statement that I was supposed to sign. And so I went through and I blacked out those things that I did not say, and uh, then sign the paper. Well, did his nose flare? What? <laughs> what did, did his nose flare? Yeah. Well, it was it was rather tense. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the best thing though was, um, and this I'll never forget. <clears throat> she came back to the house in Renton. And she told me this, and I, I said, that's the end of your career. And uh, uh, she said, an officer always tells the truth. And I thought to myself, well, I know a lot of officers 
who haven't told the truth. And sure enough, after she was, you know, suddenly her name was in the news, all of our previous friends, military friends, who used to come over to the house if we had a party or something, they disappeared because they were afraid of losing all of their gray benefits. You can't blame them because they didn't want to be cut off from their retirement or anything else or access to the exchanges. I don't know what all, but, but Greta was the okay. only one who said an officer <clears throat> always tells the truth. And so she was the most courageous person I had ever met and still have. So there. You see but then later on, later on when she would give speeches, it was very funny. She would say, uh, Diane is the reason that I'm not a general. <laughs> and that was the truth too. I mean, <laughs> if I hadn't met you, I might have been in uh, been at the general. Pentagon and uh, yeah. a general. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was I, amazed at how many people do not tell the truth. No, right. like most of them. Yeah. Well, you know, I thought in terms of looking at a couple of relationship, uh, to go through something like that and stay intact and it's very, mm. and, uh, you know, you got through it. Yeah. This is, you know, in a relationship that's solid like yours and ours, uh, you do this, you get through it mm. and as awful as it is. Well, the, the interesting thing is, you know, the aftermath for us has been, so curiously positive and things that we've been a part of and participated in since we would never have dreamed of, you know, mm -hmm. all, all, all I had wanted was to be instrumental in changing the policy as it existed. And, and you were, well, but you know, it, it became <laughs> don't ask, don't tell. Mm -hmm. And then you had 17 years of, of lobbying and trying to get that uh, overturned. Uh, and I think for me, probably the vindication of it all was being invited to lead the Pledge of Allegiance at the signing ceremony of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, one of those times when I think probably all 300 of us were teary at uh, the thought of uh, being able to say that now the Pledge of Allegiance felt like we it included us. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's big. Uh, that's what we want is inclusion. You know, yeah. it's really, I don't care. You don't have to agree with my sexual preference, but, you know, I just, I'm part of the world. Yeah. Well, but, I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's right. the distressing part right now of, of um, the efforts to, First, uh, the abortion decision, then the discussion about uh, Clarence Thomas and him uh, go wanting to take on contraception and and gay marriage. Uh, and it's very um, disconcerting to know how long we have fought for those rights and privileges, and then to have you know, someone else decide that, no, we don't deserve equal treatment. Well, um, when are they going to decide that women could, shouldn't have bank accounts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember well, when. They decide right. they shouldn't vote. Yeah. Uh, no, this is all fairly new, these privileges. Well, maybe <laughs> he shouldn't have the privilege of getting married to a white woman. No, it's curi exactly. curious exactly. Curious that he didn't say that that was one that should be reevaluated oh, also. Yeah. But right. I mean, can you imagine taking away contraception as an opportunity for people to avoid? I'm, and and you hear of uh, the the number of people, women now, who are choosing to get sterilized and men to have vasectomies so that there are no accidents. Um, you know, that's that's pretty extreme as the alternative to being able to have an abortion either to save your life or or uh, because you need to uh you work. Of your it's, mental health it's when i i make this statement because i don't think people realize when i first came down to california and i was an intern 
My first rotation was OB Guyan. Was what? OB Guyan. Uh-huh. And so every night, anywhere from three to five women would come in septic and die. Yeah. Bad abortions. And I'm standing there, I'm going, what? Why don't we have at least sterile abortions for these women? And that's all they're asking for. Uh-huh. If you don't give it through medical s- systems with sterility, they're going to do it in the alleys and the, that's right. the women the are kitchen determined. tables. It's not going to stop. Right. But you're going to have the death of a lot of women. And maybe that's what they want. Uh-huh. I don't know. I don't think they had the insight to realize the ramification of the decisions. Uh, you know, it's it's not just the black and white of, of yes and no, but rather all of the ripple effect that we're now seeing in this country. I mean, <laughs> to have to go to Canada or to Mexico for for treatment. I mean, it's Japan or China. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I counseled. Um, women who had made the decision to have an abortion. And it's very important. And they remember it. It wasn't made lightly. Um, it's, it's a part of their life in a different way. Yeah. And many times it's the doctor who is really recommending this, knowing that this woman who desperately wants this child will not live, cannot live. That's right. Uh, because this child, is, this embryo is going to kill her and, and, and so on. And um, uh, it's not a decision to be made by some individual in a sterile environment at the Supreme Court. They obviously cannot make that decision. No, you, know, you know, what I keep thinking is if they had any of the experiences that these women have had, in terms of uh, one of their daughters being raped or their uh, their wife having an ectopic pregnancy or uh, having some medical condition where you had to choose between treatment for cancer or, uh, or an abortion. Uh, if, if any of those experiences were things that these folks who are making the decision actually had uh, in their own life, you know, you wonder if they would feel the same way about it, uh, because it's one thing to give lip service to it. It's something totally different when it it's part of your lived experience. But there's also the elephant in the room, which is that uh, most of those conservative justices are Catholic. And the Catholic is taught from cradle on that abortion is wrong. And they're they're uh, almost inured to the notion that, of course, if the mother dies, that's the way God wants it, because the important thing is to save the embryo, uh, the fetus, the zygote, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, and when I was a little kid, my mother always said, uh, there were two big hospitals in Phoenix, Good Samaritan and St. Joseph's. And my mother always said, we're not going to St. Joseph's. We were Methodists. And she said, not, that really it boiled down to the fact that a good friend of my mother's um, uh, lost her life at St. Joe's uh, because um, uh, she was having a baby and uh, they wouldn't uh, save her life and sacrifice the baby. Well, so who lost? Her husband lost a wife and mother and her children. She had three already. They lost their mother. And so what was the fairness in that, that a man should lose his wife and three children are left motherless. And all this, uh, all this because of a child who had not yet been born. Uh, so the, to, uh, I was afraid from that point on, I was afraid of St. Joseph's. I can see why. I, 
And I, I would go to St. Joseph's for something um, uh, that had nothing to do with OBGYN, I'll put it that way. But, um, yeah, well, you know, and that's otherwise. also a misnomer because if you needed, if you were in hospice, well, uh, yes, it, that's true. you know, uh, that this is carries, carries throughout and, uh, it's, um, you know, and there's, there's also the, for me, there's also the audacity of somebody else telling me what I can do with my body. Exactly. Yeah. It is just. Really, I I had an experience in um, 1971. Uh, I'd had a back injury and was on medication. They did x-rays and I didn't realize that I was pregnant. Uh, abortions had just recently become, uh, Roe v. Wade had just recently been passed and so I went to see somebody because I was concerned about uh, birth defects and, and everything and, and wanted an abortion. And I went in, I had an appointment with somebody I'd never seen before. And it was an old guy with white hair. Uh, and he said, oh, don't worry about it. You know, women have had x-rays and the medications that you were on. And uh, so everything will be fine. Uh, and so he was not keen on uh, doing a DNC. And uh, about three days later, you know, I was trying to, you know, get this in my mind that maybe everything was okay. I started bleeding. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I've started bleeding. I am going to do everything I can to keep that bleeding going so that I, uh, I will have a spontaneous abortion. I drove from Seattle to, to, uh, to Portland and back again because I had, it, you know, it was on my, my list of things to do and got home and had the spontaneous abortion and thought, you know, this guy didn't know what he was talking about. Nature took care of its own, but how fortunate uh, it was for me. And on the flip side of it, being very sad and wondered if I was ever going to be able to uh, carry another child because my husband and I had had, had wanted to have uh, more children. And it wasn't until I got pregnant uh, a third time now and uh, that went to, uh, you know, went uh, was uncomplicated that there was that settling in my mind because there was sadness that, that goes with it. And, and, you know, it was Diane talking about uh, the counseling mm -hmm. that that was so important because nobody makes those decisions uh, just really no. nilly. Yeah. Um, I was saying too, and also that the fetus from its get go of the meeting of the sperm and the ovum is a parasite mm -hmm. until it comes out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it just is. Now, what happened to you was the parasite got killed. Yeah. Right. Those right. things you thought would alter the fetus such that it would have genetic in, yeah. or a right. screw up. Uh -huh. So your body, the, the parasite got killed by what, what you were going through. And so uh -huh. you eliminated it. Uh -huh. the, for me, if you think of it as a parasite rather than a person, you have a much different imagery of what right. should happen. Well, you know, it was probably 15 years ago or so where um, I had seen somewhere that the definition of, of a fetus uh, in the dictionary was changed. Ah. And it was changed from fetus to baby. Ah. Oh, wow. Really? Oh. Yeah. I've noticed those changes on different things, too. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And and it, it you know it it's just that hallmark of uh you know trouble is is coming uh -huh. and uh it was it was shocking and it still is a, a right. people talking about a baby when it is a fetus or as you say a couple of Parasite. cells yep uh, right yeah it would not Parasite. live it would yeah. not live if it were not inside a human being no. uh huh it's a parasite. 
It's a parasite. And it comes out if it can stand on its own okay, but if it can't, it can't. Well, uh -huh. I, th I think it was quite ironic that after all these decisions are made in various states, including that, uh, you know, a baby is a person at a conception, that uh, that that woman uh, who was getting a ticket for driving a speeding ticket was uh, saying to the police that, well, you know, I'm pregnant. And so uh, there are two people in the car and uh, <laughs> that, you know, that immediately was going to the courts. And I, I don't know where it went in the scheme of things, but that's what she was challenging <laughs> the police uh, with. There are two of us here, according to this law. Oh, fast thinking. <laughs> but you knew that that had to that had to be challenged at some point. Yeah. Uh, well, you know that Judge Barrett, I, unfortunately, carries my name, and I don't like that. But, you know, she was the one that said, "All we lesbians are so lucky because it'd be all these babies we can go and pick up." What? Yeah, yeah. That that's why all these women. Should not have abortions. They should go through with the process, give birth, and then drop the babies in the parking lot or something. So the lesbians get it. She said that, but the lesbians should be happy. So we can. Yeah, go but you've got to. You've got to be in the state. You have to be in a state where lesbians are allowed to have children. Uh, you know, gay couples in some places are not allowed. Uh, I, I mean, it, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Well, well now this with this. Uh, getting rid of uh, uh, Roe Wade, uh, it's also threatening um, um, test tube babies. Yeah, and, and you know, doing away with, uh, with contraceptives. Can you just imagine what this world would be like? I mean, you'd have the horniest guys in the world uh, <laughs> just because, uh, you know, if oh. you have no contraceptive, uh, and, you know, for the women in the military uh, to not have access, even if they're not married, the risk of rape mm -hmm. and uh, sexual assault in the military is, uh, and therefore, you know, they are caught in a real bind because if they got pregnant by, because of the Hyde Amendment, they can't get abortions on a military base, but then to not be able to get it out in the civilian world uh, either. I mean, it's, it's, um, well, the, 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 whole, patients. the whole control. Yeah. The oral what? The whole control. Oh, yeah. of pregnancy and therefore the future generations lies with the woman. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. she's either going to have sex or she isn't going to have sex. And she's going to be raped. Well, she huh. may be raped, but I'm just saying it's, it's one of those things that it's women in control of all sex again. They didn't realize that because they want to be in control of all the future generations, <laughs> which they're not. Yeah, but it is curious. Uh, you know, we, we moved from a time, at least when, when we were young, where you, you didn't have premarital sex because if the woman got pregnant, then you'd end up going to Claren uh, or right. to... Uh, uh, the the, uh, the homes home for way, wayward girls, right, and right. then come back nine months later, and everything else, and then we move to free free love, free sex, uh, and and now it's you know everybody hooks up after a drink in a bar, and uh, then then it's sort of like well what's going to be happening now? Are women going to do again? decide, you know, maybe I'll just wait until the, the, there is a better time or a, a better, uh, you know, no, no sex before marriage. Uh, if, you know, because it, it seems as though government is just sort of sneaking in on all sorts of personal choices and decisions. And uh, it, we're going back in time. Um, yeah, I can tell you're ready to do that Roe v. Wade. Video. Yeah. <laughs> I, think just, I think you've just had it. <laughs> <laughs> no cameo appearance. See? It's just a, it's a, yeah. It's frightening to me that our Supreme our Supreme Court can make such a stupid mistake. You know, I mean, they want 
to go back to where men controlled money, controlled the everything. And the, the thing is that they don't really control the future generation or the production of the future generation. And that's what they want control of. But they are not going to get it. But I mean, the woman controls that. Well, this is a slightly different thing, but it's related to the loss of Roe Wade by these uh, five justices who believe in, uh, the, what are they called, the uh, um, uh, constitutional judges or something, because they believe anything right. in the Constitution is mm -hmm. right. be eliminated. Well, I'm sorry, but the 18th century is not the 20, the 21st century. And why should we as human beings sacrifice all that knowledge that we have subsequently learned about the world, the universe, human nature, science, and pretend like nothing has happened, you know, since the day that men wore breeches and uh, pilgrims had buckles on their shoes and uh, uh, well, that you know would, what I mean? It's just mean, absurd. But then they really should eliminate uh, the use of the AR-15 because that was not part of the Constitution. Right, they, they only had say, muskets. Well, yeah, right. they could only have those types of weapons. Yeah, you only okay. had one. You get one shot for what you put down the musket. You didn't have. You couldn't put a pull two shots in five minutes. Right. No. No, here they can riddle. two you or three. Riddle minutes. the body with right. you couldn't riddle yeah. the body. Sort of like one, I don't understand. One ejaculation. <laughs> That's it. That's it. You got to go to the bathroom for the rest. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice one. One ejaculation. No, no more. Oh, but she has to wear this. This is. Marge is a jewelry designer. Oh, sure, sure. That, that's one of the hobbies. Okay. Don't pull. No, I'm just lifting. Okay, <laughs> let's see it. That's that's Diane's. Let's see. Back up a little Back bit. up, Diane. Back Go. up. What? Back up? Yeah, yeah, I can't see you. We can't see it. Oh, it's a um, a painter's hand, a left-handed painter. Ha, huh, I'll need it. Okay. A brush. Holding a brush. She designed it. Great. See, and Smith made it. Yeah. yeah. This is Marge's design, Star of My Heart. That's me. Yeah. yeah. And I had to put the red stone in it so it shows all the <laughs> energy she has. In it. <laughs> right. Well, uh, not to be outdone, okay. uh, Diane had this made for me, which is the symbol of the uh, the medical unit that I was assigned to in Vietnam. Wow. Wow. That's great. So we all, how about, how about you, Meg, Marge? No, we have these. Yep. Yeah. Right. This way. We designed them. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see it here. Hold your hand. There. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Nice. Yeah. Well, and ours are the, uh, the buckle rings. The buckle rings. Uh, yeah. Why that? Why the buckle? All right. Can well, it, 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 it's the Ed Edwardian buckle ring, and uh, Diane was in London right after we had met before before she came to, or uh, on her second visit, and uh, found this in a jewelry store in Bristol. In Bristol. No. Mm. Uh, not Bristol, down on the coast. It's all right. And uh, brought the ring back and in short order uh, gave it to me and uh, said that if I didn't want it, she would take it. And I said, no, I'll keep it. And then had a duplicate made for her. And right. so right. that's our, our wedding ring. And we, I, I, I've never taken mine off. I've never taken mine off. And actually, we've been married three times. <laughs> ah, so have we. So you go first. So um, the first time we went to Portland, when Multnomah County said that they would, they were opening up for uh, gay weddings. And then, of course, the state Supreme Court of 
Oregon. When, what year was that? Uh, that was 2004. Okay. And uh, we were there in Portland getting married too in 2004. Same, that okay. same time. Same we time. Vacation. And right. then we found out they were doing the marriage thing, so we did it. Yeah. Went to the courthouse. And um, the whole of Portland seemed to be gay that night. It was. Oh, wasn't it wonderful? Yeah. wonderful. Everything. It was fabulous. And uh, the Superior Court judge that married us, this woman, she retired shortly thereafter. And she said that, that was the happiest uh, uh, couple of days of her life. Really? And, nice. and so she just uh, resigned after that. Yeah. And, um, number two. and then um, uh, the rector at the Episcopalian Church, uh, St. Augustine's in the Woods here on the island, uh, because I had announced it that uh, Greta and I had gone to Portland over the weekend, the weekend before to get married, and everybody applauded. Oh, this could be nice. wonderful. And so um, I was anxious about it, but certain, but no, they went yay. And uh, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. So um, anyway, the rector came up to me after the service and said, "I would like to have a church blessing." Um, for this, uh, you should have a church blessing in, in addition to this. So the, and then later on, the more pressure because from him, because the Oregon um, thing was annulled. So then that summer, we had a huge wedding in our back on the lawn overlooking the Saratoga Passage and everything. And it was really quite beautiful, even though it was the hottest day, I think, on record to... <laughs> And, uh, well, it was it was us burning in hell. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, but um, everybody. Would, oh, we had family, um, friends. The place was packed, and um, and, and it was that was fabulous. That was two thousand four July. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the second wedding, and um, then the third was a a, a court. Uh, we had a wonderful um, wedding and. Um, as soon as the Washington State said it was legal, which was uh, for 2012. 12, 9, 12. Right. Yeah. 12. Yeah. yeah. So that Washington State preceded the federal uh, right. uh, marriage equality. And uh, so we got married the first day possible uh, here in the state of Washington. And uh, we had... You know how Apple, whenever Apple has a a big coming out and, and the uh, particular phone or everything, people are standing in line waiting right. to get in. Right. Well, we sat and did the same thing, only it was uh, right in front of the, uh, the, courthouse. The, the courthouse to be able to be the first ones in the uh, island county to apply for a marriage license wow. if it was legal so, so what we, time did you get there or it was about four or five yeah, in the morning yeah. in the morning yep and then we <laughs> sat, we sat with uh you know those uh, little other, other couple chairs and up. then other people started coming up and i had done reconnaissance a couple of days before to make sure that everything was going to be in order and <laughs> brought cookies and, and, and everything. And, and so everybody was hyped up uh, about this. Uh, and then we had um, uh, invited other people if they wanted to get married here, mm -hmm. that we would be able to have individual ceremonies mm -hmm. uh, at our home. And uh, so there were 10 couples. On the 12th. Uh, on the 9th. On the 9th. On, on the right, 9th right. Of, uh, of December that year. Yeah. And we got the mayor of Coopville to marry each couple. And, uh, and then Greta had prepared a little um, uh, Kransakaka. Norwegian wedding uh, cake. Little, little ring cakes, little tiny yeah. ones um, for each couple. Wow, how nice. And then she had ordered uh, champagne flutes that had the date um, on it. And then after each couple was married, in came a, a, a server with the champagne flutes full of champagne so that they could toast each other. And and, uh, 
and have some champagne. Uh, lesbians know how to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always say <laughs> this this yeah, married three times, always yeah. to the same woman. <laughs> never <did That's> right. <laughs> when I would go up, I remember one time I went up, it was in the front of the church, and this time I said, uh I was on our July twenty-fourth. Um I used that as the anniversary thing because that's when the church had had blessed us. And uh, I said that uh, uh, we'd been married three times. And the priest jumped in and said, to the same woman. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting a little nervous there. <laughs> well, it was funny because we, we had a big party when we first were when we got the rings. When we got the rings and did all that, which uh -huh. had nothing to do with anything legal or anything. I mean, right. so we got married then. And then the when we landed in Portland that year for vacation and they were marrying people, we got married. Uh, they did send me my check back, which I have held in the reserve. $60. <laughs> $60. <laughs> I kept the check. Right. Uh -huh. yeah. So they probably kept some money out of that, but at any rate, <laughs> uh, and then when it was legal, when it was legal in 2008, eight, 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 nine, nine, I think it was 2008, we were married then in the, in the state of California in the backyard. But it was sort of one of those legal things. I mean, the real thing happened before that. Right. So when the- Well, actually a wonderful thing this same priest had told, had said to us, um, he said, uh, you know, people actually marry themselves. That's interesting. Yeah. And if you're really married, uh, you have married each other and you don't need the state and you don't need the church. Thank you for today. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to get to know you.